Great. So our next speaker is Don Waller, and he's joining us from Madison today, and he's from the Department of Botany here at UW-Madison. And I think he'll probably delve into a little bit more complicated story than we got with the uh, sea lamprey in the Great Lakes. So I'll turn it over to Don. Thanks very much, Anne, and thanks, Mike, for priming us all on uh, the aquatic side of drivers and passengers. I want to talk uh, today about, uh, well, we'll start with the basic question. Uh, this idea that invasives may be passengers rather than drivers is actually part of a broader um, trend that I see in the literature where people are beginning to question whether invasive species generally and plants in particular are actually a threat to native plant communities. Um, so that'll lead into the passengers and drivers discussion. And the particular system that I have expertise on and want to talk to you about regards uh, forest environments in southern Wisconsin. We've been able to study these because of having historical baseline data that give us a detailed picture of where and when invasions have taken place. So we'll start by talking about causes of invasion and what scale those are occurring at, because that's another controversial issue. Uh, many people who infer an absence of invasive effects are looking at broad scales, where that, whereas those of us who look also at local scales often find major effects. I've also done a fair bit of research on the impacts of white-tailed deer on plant communities, and I'm trying to do experiments to figure out how the effects of deer interact with the effects of invasive species like uh, garlic mustard. And that'll lead into a discussion of the consequences, the driver side of invasion, and I'll try and sum up at the end. So um, this might seem crazy uh, to those of you who study uh, invasives and do your darndest to keep them out. But Wired Magazine, anyway, had this uh, curious article on whether we really should be admiring invasive species. And of course, they do have some aspects to admire. It's uh, pretty unusual uh, that a species makes it all the way to become invasive. It's, they are a special breed. And certainly not all exotic species become invasive. This is one pictorial uh, representation of how a species after introduction has to be able to establish initially, and then it has to be able to spread and eventually spread quickly to be perceived by us as an invasive. These are two ecologists I respect greatly uh, who have written a provocative article asking whether invasive species are really a major cause of extinctions. They admit, of course, that snakes, especially on islands, have major impacts. But you'll see at the end of this paragraph they, where they suggest that alien plants might be more likely to cause displacement and community change rather than extinctions, emphasizing the passenger role of invasive plants rather than the driver role. But we know, too, that invaders can also have major impacts. They are major drivers of uh, declines in a great many uh, threatened and endangered species and have contributed directly to the extinction of, of species as well. So I don't, I don't mean to minimize myself uh, the impact of invasives. I think often the degree to which people are willing to entertain some of these arguments that invasives aren't that bad is proportional to how much they don't know about uh, what's going on locally with invasives. We know, too, that invasives are a very expensive problem in terms of their economic impacts that they have in agriculture and forestry and aquatic systems across the US. Tallies uh, show that actually a majority of identified invasives in the U.S. are plants. And that's one reason why I focus today on plants, as well as mentioning invasive earthworms, which would be a suitable subject for an entirely uh, different uh, webinar, I suppose. And I study uh, forests myself. I know, therefore, I know them the best. Uh, and I should note here that forests generally are less invaded than more open environments because many Invasive plants are shade intolerant, weedy plants uh, that are particularly a problem in farm fields and around cities. We know that many factors are driving ecological change now uh, in uh, plant and animal communities uh, here in the temperate zone. Aside from invasive species, which may or may not be drivers themselves, we know, uh, first of all, that massive changes in land use have occurred. Most people rank habitat fragmentation and uh, isolation as the number one threat uh, to rare and uh, threatened and endangered species in the US. 
But we also know, uh, especially in these days, that climate change is uh, a major threat and an increasing one, given that it's accelerating. In recent years, I've also been looking at uh, patterns of nitrogen deposition across the region and asked to what extent uh, that might be contributing to invasive plant invasions, and as well as having direct effects on plant communities. And as I mentioned, I, I also study deer impacts. So the consequence of all these factors in general has been uh, a loss of species from many sites, and also a process of biotic homogenization, a decline in what ecologists call beta diversity, but you can call the McDonaldization uh, of plant and animal communities. Work by colleagues here at the University of Wisconsin, Volker Radlov and his colleagues, show just how dramatic the changes in habitat, uh, land use and habitat fragmentation have, have been over recent decades. Uh, we have a large footprint on the landscape and one that's spreading out from cities. So the question we're talking about today is whether this, uh, these effects of changes in land use and climate change and nitrogen deposition in deer might themselves uh, be contributing to invasions of exotic species. That is, to what extent invasives are being passengers in, uh, along with, uh, in terms of, of ecological change. And then we'll turn to this question of consequences of invasives in terms of their own direct effects on species losses within plant communities. I mentioned the study system as Wisconsin Forest. We're looking here at the sites that we've been studying. Uh, first surveyed by John Curtis and his students back in the 40s and 50s, resurveyed by my group since 2000. Uh, and you can see in this uh, pictorial diagram uh, that the relative abundance of exotic species, which were almost non-existent at these sites back in the 40s and 50s, have now become uh, moderately to very common, particularly in the areas around uh, human population concentration, cities in southern Wisconsin. So this change in exotics has been highly variable among sites, with some sites being invaded much more than others. If we now turn in particular to the forests in southern Wisconsin, you, you should recall that before European settlement, the landscapes here were a mosaic of prairie, savanna, and oak hickory forests. Uh, that fires were a regular part of that system, but that in today's world, uh, it's a landscape where fire is uh, scarce to absence, where agriculture tends to dominate, as well as spreading cities and suburbanization. And most of the woodlots that we resurveyed uh, are now uh, lightly used. We didn't resurvey any woodlots uh, that had been highly modified, had been logged or grazed directly, um, or obviously destroyed. We had 94 of these stands in southern Wisconsin, and there's a distinct difference between the unglaciated region to the west, which has a lot more topography and maintains more forests and natural cover, and the more urbanized and uh, areas to the east that are an area of intensive agriculture where the glaciers did occur. You can see the invasions have been more pronounced in the areas more modified by agriculture and cities. I mentioned John Curtis and his students uh, doing this research back in the 40s and 50s. Uh, this book is still in print, and we use it as a textbook in our own Vegetation of Wisconsin class. In our resurveys, we found that most of these southern Wisconsin forests had lost diversity over the last 50 years, uh, about a quarter of their diversity at both the one square meter scale and at the 20 square meter uh, scale. That was the extent of Curtis's uh, survey of the understory. So that dotted line in the graph shows what we would have if uh, sites all maintained more or less the same number of species that they used to have. The reality is that the, more, the sites with more species have lost more species uh, since then. We think this is related to a number of factors, uh, including those I mentioned. But this increasing shade and successional processes also play a part here. Locally, we also see changes in beta diversity, this McDonald's effect. Within uh, a site, the quadrats are more similar to each other than they used to be, and uh, the sites themselves resemble each other much more. Interestingly, this is not being driven by invasive species the way you might expect it to be. That is, if weeds are occurring in all of our forested sites, that would tend to make them more similar. It's actually increases in common native species that's driving this increasing similarity among sites. 
the losers are the pretty wildflowers, uh, the things that botanists like to find and study. The winners uh, include uh, these common natives. These are species that were already common in the 40s and 50s, but have now become still more common. Uh, Parthenocissus, Virginia creeper there in the lower left, used to be mostly a vine. Now you often see it sprawling across the forest floor. But we also see increases in a lot of exotic taxa. The ones I'm going to focus on are Aliaria, garlic mustard, rhamnus, the buckthorn, and Lanicera honeysuckle. These are among the top four species that have invaded in southern Wisconsin. Aliaria is a biennial. It was introduced to the U.S. in the mid-1800s. It was the most abundant exotic herb in these forests, occurring at a mean frequency of 30%. Ramnus, the buckthorn, is a large understory shrub that also invaded in the 1800s, and it was our commonest woody exotic invader, occurring, uh, as you can see, at almost half the sites with a mean frequency of about 12%. And honeysuckle, and these are not strangers to any of you, I'm sure, uh, is also a shrub coming hailing from Asia, occurring in a third, more than a third of our sites and a little bit less abundant. All of these species thrive uh, in disturbed landscapes and uh, disturbed areas within forests. They are also very efficient at intercepting resources. They tend to, the shrubs tend to keep their leaves later into the fall and leaf out earlier in the spring. They may be benefiting from climate change. And interestingly, all three of these species are also known to secrete chemicals that can suppress the growth of nearby plants. About a quarter of the stands had exotics in 1950, generally at very low frequency, versus 82% of our stands now. And there's been an increase, a six times increase in the abundance of these exotics where they are present. These invasions uh, reflect both an increase in the number of uh, exotic species within each stand and an increase in the abundance of those species in the stands where they occur. And uh, if we turn now to passengers and drivers again, uh, we can look at the causes of extinction, or causes of invasion, rather, and whether those are the same factors that are driving uh, changes in the native community. We know that uh, invaders generally have high fecundity and effective dispersal. Uh, they are pre-adapted to invade disturbed sites in many cases. Uh, ecologists call them R-selected. In some cases, we also know that they carry novel weapons in the sense of these chemicals are able to secrete. They can often suppress the growth of plants around them. That's a, an interesting twist on that for the garlic mustard is that the chemicals it secretes actually suppress mycorrhizal fungi, which almost all other plants use, but which uh, mustards, including the garlic mustard, do not use. Uh, enemy releases another hypothesis that because these are introduced species, they've gotten away from their co-evolved uh, pathogens and um, herbivores in a way that allow them to thrive in this new continent. And then Bert Blasi at Cornell's uh, come up with this idea that in response to an absence of enemies, many of these plant species may be reallocating resources away from defense into faster growth or increased competitive ability. At any rate, we expect there to be a, a contagion effect that in general, uh, invasive species are spreading out from where they were first introduced. There's also uh, the idea that some sites are far more invadable than others, uh, a, a demand pull on, that it makes them uh, vulnerable to being invaded. Uh, for many years, ecologists have uh, wondered or speculated about whether more diverse communities are better at resisting invasion. But Jessica Gurevich, in that paper I uh, showed you earlier, claims invasion is actually positively associated with native species diversity. And that's been noted by others as well, although a debate has uh, come along on what scale you look at. In our own data, we looked at what predicts exotic invasions, and we found that sites with fewer native species in 1950 indeed did experience slightly more invasions by exotic species. So that lends support to this diversity resistance hypothesis. However, when we included in a more complicated model other variables, this effect of initial diversity disappeared. 
And it was true in addition, even on the simple univariate tests, only for honeysuckle and buckthorn. So we, the bottom line here is that we think it may be an artifact of the, the complicated interactions that are occurring. We, on the other hand, we're much more certain that, that land management has strong effects on invasions. The increase in exotic abundance has to do uh, with a number of factors. All of these three, for example, are important. Not surprisingly, where trails are denser, where the public has more access, you see more invasions. Uh, but I was particularly struck by the even bigger effect we found on whether hunting was allowed. If hunting is allowed, we see fewer, uh, 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 less of an increase in invasive, invasives, suggesting that deer uh, might be playing a role in facilitating the invasion of many stands. <clears throat> Turning now to landscape variables, we analyzed each of our sites in terms of a number of landscape variables like house and rosing, road density, patch size, and cover within a, a range of two to five kilometers to assess the degree to which uh, these landscape factors might now be affecting patterns of invasion. We see evidence here um, in our own work. This is Dave Rogers, my former PhD student, uh, noted that, that we have an extinction debt that's being paid. That is, sites that initially uh, were smaller but still maintaining their diversity have lost their, their native plant diversity in the 50 years since then. We'd like to know how much of this might be due to invasions. We'd also like to know whether this trend will continue. That is, whether smaller sites will continue to lose more species. Many of you won't be surprised to see this, uh, that the areas that have seen uh, more roads and houses are also losing diversity faster. Uh, here's a road density alone uh, versus uh, the number of new native species that were able to colonize. In general, more isolated sites that were surrounded by more roads were less able to recolonize naturally. This is important because diversity is a dynamic uh, process, maintaining diversity. And having roads here, we see evidence that the rescue effect, the ability of the local area to recapture its original diversity from the areas around it, is being interrupted. We can also see clearly that more urbanized areas are gaining uh, exotic species faster and invasives are increasing in abundance faster in areas that are more disturbed in the sense of occurring in areas of high road or housing density. If we look at native plant colonization, we see there's uh, this rescue effect going on. The more forests that are nearby, and more dominant, the more native species can colonize. And interestingly, that those effects have grown stronger than local context. So we, plant ecologists used to think plant communities were all about uh, soils and local light conditions. We see now that landscape features are having a bigger effect. And that's also true for the exotics. Here was the uh, an axis of urbanization that had the single strongest effect on exotic species colonization. So to sum up, uh, the roads, public access trails, and um, absence of hunting are all contributing to higher exotic richness and abundance. Uh, that fits in with our idea that these are colonizing species that depend on dispersal to get into these sites. The hunting uh, factor suggests that abundant deer might be facilitating exotic invasions, and that's a, a mechanism we'd like to understand uh, better. We also see, by the way, that uh, more invasives in areas with high soil nitrogen. And whether uh, we think that may be, uh, that is nit the pollution from air, aerial nitrogen deposition may be also facilitating invasion. If we look uh, at leaf nitrogen content and compare it between those plant species that have increased over the last 50 years and those that have decreased, we'll see that the increasers are, are nitrogen-loving species. Uh, and that includes invasive species. In a more complicated analysis, we looked at the abundance uh, of garlic mustard and asked what that depended on. You can see it increases in sites that have more soil nitrogen uh, and that have heavy trail use, as I mentioned before. But you'll also see separate, and in addition to those other two effects, 
that sites that are receiving more um, nitrogen, acid rain, in the form of acid rain or dry precipitation coming out of the sky are seeing higher rates of invasion. This might explain, again, why we see more invasions in southeast Wisconsin near uh, Chicago, Racine, Waukesha, Milwaukee than we do in the other parts of the state. So getting back to this question about whether deer are playing roles in invasion, uh, we know that deer could have several effects. They can spread seeds both in by eating seeds and passing them out in their feces. They also, many stick tight uh, plant species spread themselves by sticking to the sides of deer. We also know that deer have the effect of compacting soil and disturbing the litter, which creates the kinds of uh, disturbed and mineral soil conditions that favor invasions. And they're concentrating nitrogen in many cases or adding to it via their own urine or feces. So there could be a fertilizer effect. We also know that deer could facilitate invasions if they uh, prefer to eat the native wildflowers and understory shrubs uh, and avoid the invasive species. In fact, this is true. Deer generally don't eat honeysuckle and buckthorn and garlic mustard. Uh, that's probably for a variety of reasons, but it may include those chemical deterrents I mentioned. The ecologists call this a parent competition. When one plant suffers from the presence of another plant, not from direct kind of elbow room effects, but because they're a predator is focusing their attention on the native it may also be that deer, uh, well, it is true that deer are associated with higher uh, exotic invasive earthworm populations. And again, that's something we need to learn more about it. This has to be one of my favorite paper titles of all time, The Good, the Bad, and the Ungulate. Um, but um, it's pointing out this association uh, between high deer densities and the ability of many exotic plant species to invade and do well. We also hear increasingly about invasion cascades, the idea that it isn't just one invader, but that multiple invaders may be facilitating each other's invasions. If deer make for better conditions for weedy plants, they might also make for better conditions for weedy earthworms, which in turn could also help the invasive plants. These pictures from the understory shows you just how dramatic some of these, uh, how dramatically the, these invasive worms can change the leaf litter area. We also see higher levels of soil nitrogen and faster nitrogen cycling in areas with more worms and more deer. Again, that's going to benefit invasive species, invasive plants. So we decided to do an experiment in five state parks in southern Wisconsin where we asked uh, a simple question, but looking at for this interaction, whether deer are having an effect on uh, these particular species of native plant that we planted into and outside these exclosures, and whether garlic mustard were having an effect. We started in areas that had dense covers of garlic mustard. We weeded half of those areas uh, and planted our plants in and outside the fence and into and next to where alley area was growing. What we find was uh, that for um, this lily, uvularia, the deer have a pronounced effect, uh, diminishing number of branches and its survival. Likewise, garlic mustard uh, has an effect of increasing uh, the number of branches and actually increasing survival. That was a bit of an, uh, a surprise. We didn't expect uh, Aliaria to be helping uh, um, this lily, but it could be because it's the lily is hiding in amongst the garlic mustard and not being eaten, eaten as much by deer. So what I've just uh, told you is that urbanization and agriculture are contributing to invasions, that climate change uh, we're not as certain of yet, but we're beginning to accumulate evidence that that too may be contributing to exotic increases. Definitely nitrogen deposition is favoring the high nitrogen soils that invading plant species exploit. And we also now, as you've seen, have evidence that deer are increasing invasions. So now it remains to ask this uh, driver, this last driver question down here, whether invasives are themselves affecting these species losses and biotic homogenization patterns that I showed you, or whether exotics are really just passengers uh, riding along with the rest of these. So 
One approach to this, I mentioned scale before. Many people have claimed there's a positive association between invasions and native plant diversity. Look at a growth scale, a large scale. And we decided to do very fine scale analyses at the site and even at the individual one meter square quadrat level to see what effects these plants were having. Well, we don't need to worry about the details here. We used a technique based on checkerboard scores. But you may be interested, if you don't already know about this coefficient of conservatism score, or CC value, that uh, professional botanists in the Midwest have ranked all species from the extreme of zero or one for exotic, invasive, or super common native species to a nine or 10 if they're highly habitat specific and very particular about where they grow, generally rare and threatened plant species. And that was another factor we decided to look at. You'll see in this diagram that the associations are all negative, except one that's zero, uh, between those three invasives, the garlic mustard, honeysuckle, and buckthorn, and uh, 70 native species. This is an average uh, across 94 sites. So, so what you're seeing here is that negative associations dominate. And then we further found an evidence that these negative associations were bigger in more urbanized landscapes. Uh, at the type top, you see at the site level, and the bottom graph you see at the quadrat level, things are more heterogeneous at the quadrat level. But what's conspicuous there is that the positive associations that invasive plant species have are often with already common increasing native plant species, whereas the negative ones are often with rare uh, uh, local, rare native species, and often ones that have these high coefficients of conservatism. This shows that effect, a CC coefficient of conservatism is on the x-axis here. And at the site scale, alley area uh, is having bigger uh, effects on, on the rarer plants that have high CC values. At the quadrat scale, the honeysuckle and the buckthorn are having greater effects on exactly those plant species that are most threatened uh, by biotic homogenization and declines in diversity. So to sum up, uh, I think you've seen here evidence that alien uh, invasive species are acting as both passengers and sometimes as drivers of ecological change. Uh, I've shown you that forests are more vulnerable to exotic invaders when they're small, when they're surrounded by roads and houses, uh, when they're uh, penetrated by trails, uh, and when deer are dense uh, because the stand isn't being hunted. I, there's also an effect, uh, there are diversity effects and herb cover effects, but those, as I mentioned, were mixed. Proximity to surrounding lands being infested is also a factor. Many people have found, for example, in wooded areas in northern Wisconsin that invasives are occurring along logging trails. And earthworms turn out to be uh, a co-facilitator of native plant, or rather exotic plant invasions. On the consequences side of things, we see that in the, these three invasive uh, plant species invading the, these sites can sometimes associate positively or negatively with particular native species. And at the site level, this isn't significant a lot of the time, but at the one meter square quadrat level, many of the positive associations are with already common native species, whereas the negative associations often occurred with rare and declining uh, species of high coefficient of conservatism. We also saw that those negative associations increased in landscapes with more roads and houses. So um, I guess I concluded that uh, it's worthwhile looking at things at more than one scale and over longer time periods to really try and understand these patterns of invasion. Uh, we can't predict the future, uh, of course, uh, but we can get better insight into the mechanisms that are driving these changes. Uh, thanks, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, 